Hey guys, uh, Tom Davis here, America's canine educator. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Uh, I was going to go live earlier, but uh, I had some technical difficulties on hooking up a new system for my live. But today, we're going to stick to the old telephone here on the iPhone, and uh, that'll be fine. Today, I have a topic of discussion uh, because everyone's off work and staying home. Hey, Andrew, what's up, bro? Uh, staying home, and they're not going out and, and working, obviously, because of the coronavirus. So if you're watching this in the future, um, this was filmed during the coronavirus, but it's still very applicable how to deal with dogs who were <clears throat> off leash. So yesterday I went to a park and uh, there was a lot of dogs uh, off off leash and a lot of dogs on leash, which which was great because at the end of the day, the dogs are outside enjoying themselves, which is awesome. So I just wanted to give you guys some really easy tips on how to handle encounters with other dogs who are off leash and some tips on what to do. Um, and then after this, we're going to get into some Q&A from you guys. So if you guys have any questions, you can answer them, ask them after uh, I go over this topic. And today, I only have one topic, so it gives me a lot of time uh, to be able to answer your questions after this. So stick tuned. If you guys are joining me here live or in the future, just uh, go ahead and hit that like button and let me know you guys are here. Too much sun? too much sun. Okay. <clears throat> so here's some tips on how to deal with that stuff, guys. So always be aware of your surroundings. Uh, that's like the biggest thing. What I do when I'm out is I'm constantly having my head on a swivel, looking for other people, other dogs, um, <clears throat> and really just, just constantly just looking to make sure that there's no potential threats nearby. Um, because a lot of people just let their dogs go. And sometimes they you know, and I'm guilty of this too, is I will, I will literally let my dogs go not knowing that there's other dogs. And I know that my dog's recall is good, but theirs isn't. So I think just that's the first thing is, is head in the swivel and be respectful to the people that are around you. Um, I know yesterday I had uh, two of my dogs out and I deal with, um, you know, one of my dogs is usually off leash running around my duchy. And uh, she's obviously really great at, at recall because she's e-collar trained on the dog tra and she's great. Um, but the thing is, is a lot of other people don't know that. And I'm guilty of that as well. If I see somebody off leash, I immediately stop and I don't move forward because I don't trust that person. And, um, and they don't know how well trained your dog is or if they're not. And chances are the dog that's off leash is probably not trained to be fair. Um, so I I'm guilty of that as well. So just make sure that you're respectful for other people that are out with their dog because um, I think it's just the right thing to do. Uh, and if you guys are here in this live chat or in the future, like this video um, and let me know you guys are here. All you have to do is hit that like button. Uh, there's over 100 people here. Woohoo! Hey, Beth, what's up? Um, so now we're going to move to the second thing is um, just making sure that you're, you're, you're – aware of where you're going as well. I think that that's very important that when you go places, if you're going to go to an off-leash dog park and your dog's not good with dogs, I mean, I don't recommend dog parks anyway, um, but just know that you're going to be not avoiding any dogs. But if you're in, like what I do when I go to a pull-off to get my dogs out to a trail or if I'm at a park, um, I'm checking how many cars are there. I investigate what stickers are on their car, if they have leashes in their car. I mean, I, I go the whole nine to make sure I know what I'm getting myself into um, just because that, that's me taking extra uh, precautions. So um, now a couple other things that you guys can do is there's some really great tools to deter dogs as well. So there's this tool that's called um, Doggy Don't. It's D-O-G-G-I-E don't. Uh, I'm going to link it after this video is, is off live. So if you guys are watching this in the future, you guys can check out the description uh, and there's going to be a link in there for the doggy don't. Uh, and what it is, is it's, it's basically a really high, high end noisemaker. It sounds like a taser. Um, and all you do is you, you hit a button and it just goes pop, 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 really, really, really loud. Um, and it's, 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 it's typically for, uh, telling dogs to not bark. Um, it's just a, it's just a, it's a dog deterrent. Um, and so I bring that, I brought that with me yesterday, just put it in my pocket. Um, mainly what I find with the doggy don't that works really well is when dogs are coming at you and you, you sound that doggy don't off and it's going bam, bam, bam. 
it gives the dog owner the opportunity to go, oh, wait a minute, I didn't know there was a person there, or holy crap, I better get my dog back. Um, and so that's why I really like the doggy don't, because it really just lets you know, especially if you're in your trail or you're hiking and you're on a mountain um, and there's hills and people can't really see you, the doggy don't is a good like, hey, I'm here. Uh, and then you can recall your dog. And so um, that's a really great tool to use. Like I said, I think it's like $30 on Amazon. And uh, it's a pretty pretty nice tool to have when you guys are out for walks if you're constantly running into off-leash dogs. Um, so the other thing uh, that I suggest people to do is if you're, if you're walking, yeah, an air horn is good too. Um, you, can, you can do that. Just a lot of times people don't, uh, carry air horns with them because they're bigger. The doggy don't is like, it's like this, it's small. Uh, so anyway, yeah, you can do an air horn as well. Um, the other thing I recommend is carrying an extra leash with you, uh, especially if you're hiking, walking, um, or, or whatever with somebody else. Uh, because I've, I've come into the, to the opportunity to, to have handing my dogs off to the person I'm with and being able to take that leash and approach that off-leash dog because sometimes off-leash dogs are not with an owner. They got out of their house or whatever, depending on where you guys live. It could just be an off-leash dog that's living on the streets. So a lot of times what I do is I bring an extra leash with me and I'm able to, to then uh, approach the dog that's off-leash by simply handing the leash off to somebody else uh, handling the dog. So that's another really great thing, um, tip for you guys to do is to simply, uh, bring an extra leash so you can go and, and approach that other dog, leash the dog up and, and walk it back to the owner, or at least play it safe. Because one thing that I, <clears throat> I will say about this, that it doesn't really matter if your dog is, uh, it likes dogs or not. Um, it's all about the other dog. And even if that dog likes dogs and your dog likes dogs, that that really rushed meet and greet is not a good idea regardless of the circumstances. So even if you have two dogs that are semi-friendly or friendly, that whole I'm running after you uh, meet and greet is, is not ideal anyway. So do the best you can to avoid those types of meet and greets at all costs, especially if there's not uh, a dog owner around because I think that that's, you know, that's really big. Um, the other thing is, is just telling the other dog owners very simply like, hey, like waving them down and telling them like my dog's not friendly. Because um, as you guys know, you're going to run into a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, you get that person that's like, hey, my dog's friendly. It drives me crazy. Uh, we've even thought about making shirts like with my dog's friendly with a circle and a cross through it just to tell people like that, that doesn't matter. Um, that's not really, that's not really that none of that matters. Uh, it's all about the dog that you have and it's all about respect. If you're out for a walk with your dog, enjoying yourselves. I mean, even like for me, uh, having like an elderly dog with me who d can't really stand up that good, can't walk that good, is a little wobbly, a little insecure because they can't see or hear good. Um, it's just not, it's just not a good vibe at all. So just, that's the other thing I tell people is just tell, waving your hands and saying, Hey, my dog's not friendly. Um, I've even thought about making a sound box that says my dog's not friendly just to tell people like, get your dog. Um, because at the end of the day, I think that, um, the most important thing is, is the dog's, it's not the dog's fault, unfortunately. Like if you let your dog off leash, um, which leads me to my, to my next tip, uh, and, and, and safety guidelines with, with handling these types of situations. Um, but it's not the dog's fault. It's the owner's fault. So if there's a, there's a happy go lucky six month old dog, that's like, Hey, another person, another dog. I love both of those things. And both of your dogs or one of your dog doesn't like other dogs or whatever. It's not the dog's fault. Unfortunately, it's the, it's the owner's fault. Um, so that kind of leads me to my, one of my last things about, um, about, uh, a, this type of situation or this environment is just making sure that if you do let your dogs off leash at any given time that you have responsible, consistent recalls. I think that that's huge. If you're going to be that person that says like I did it yesterday, um, the park that we were at is a, is a Saratoga park here in upstate New York. And it's, it's got a big open, um, golf course in the middle and the golf course isn't open right now. But um, it's, it's nice enough. Yesterday it was like 65 degrees and it's really nice to go out and be able to enjoy the outdoors. And I had my dogs off leash, but out of respect to other people, as soon as I see other dogs, two things is I don't want to say, hey, my dog's off leash. That means they're friendly because that's not, I don't think that that run, that registers through 
to through people's minds, they they automatically do assume that they don't register like, oh, that person has really good recall and they're responsible. That's why their dog is off leash. A lot of times it's, hey, your dog's off leash. They must be friendly and they might want to play. And then you get that other person that goes clip, boom, and the dog goes and it's it's terrible. It's a nightmare. So anyway, if you guys can do me a favor, there's over almost 150 people in here. Um, really quick, we're going to get into your questions, but um, do me a favor, guys, and like this video and then after you like this video, leave your questions and I'm, I'm going to get right into questions today instead of going into other topics. But um, I hope that those, those topics help you guys. Um, pepper spray is another thing that you can do if it's something that it happens frequently um, and your dog is being attacked uh, for sure. So anyway, let's, let's get those likes rolling in. And if you're watching this in the future, um, thank you so much for, for joining us. We're going to answer some dog training questions as well from dog owners. So this will be interesting. And uh, let's see. Okay. Let's get some dog training questions in here. Boom, 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 boom. How do you stop attack? Uh, good question, Andrew. It, pretty much exactly how I was talking about doggy don'ts, air horns, pepper spray. Um, there's really not much you can do. Uh, that's a really good question, actually. What I like to do, um, if I see an off-leash dog, and I've done this before uh, when I was a dog walker, uh, if, I, if I see an off-leash dog coming at us and I, and I don't know that dog or whatever, I'll try to find a car to get onto, a truck bed, um, a porch, uh, anything that I can try to get away from this dog and protect the dogs that I'm with. Um, so that's a really great question, actually. Um, so we got a question here. It says, how do I stop a seven month old mouthing hands when excited? Well, I think, uh, this is something that I cover pretty much every live, uh, but I think it's just such a, it's such a common question. Um, puppies are, are, are meant, I shouldn't say that puppies are used to, uh, living with mom and dad and brothers and sisters. And so they will mouth and they will teeth throughout the first 10 weeks uh, and, and beyond of their life. Um, and they, they basically play like this and they communicate like this. And so when you get them, that's exactly how they communicate to you. So when you're dealing with a puppy that's biting, don't give them your extremities. So just make a fist if they're biting you, it's not as fun. Uh, the other thing is, is just not giving them anything to chew on that's you and giving them something to play with, uh, I think too is, um, so that's one thing I would recommend. And the other thing that I would recommend too is when a puppy's biting, you can just pinch their cheek in so they, they chew on themselves. But I think it's just, I think it's just important to know that uh, puppies are constantly playing with their mouths. That's how they communicate until we humanize them and make them uh, not, a, not a, a very primalistic animal anymore, or very domesticated. Uh, because even when we get dogs at like eight weeks, they're not, uh, you know, they're still dogs. And then when we get them, we teach them how to like be a little bit more coexisting. So I think just being patient with it. Um, but anyway, so uh, let's see. How, how mm, Brett, good question. How young is too young to start working a dog on a prong collar? Um, so the prong collar is just a, a reinforcement tool that um, is used very, very nicely with, uh, with um, communication. Uh, it's, it's one of the safest tools to use on the contrary of what people believe. Uh, the prong collar is one of those tools that uh, can also look scary and also could be used wrong, unfortunately. So some people don't like them because of those reasons. But the prong collar could be administrated uh, pretty much as soon as the dog knows what you're asking. So again, the prong collar is something that we're going to be using to reinforce what we're asking. So if we tell a dog, to, I mean, you can use it to teach certain things like heal and things like that. But I would say at an average six months uh, and a little, just depending on the breed, Six months is definitely like totally cool, um, but if a dog is is pretty intelligent and uh, not sensitive at an earlier age, you can certainly use it then. Um, so, uh, hello, hello everybody. My dog barks. My dog barks at neighbors when in the garden. Should I try promo? I think promo means I don't know. I don't know. What? Oh, the prong collar maybe. Um, you could, uh, but you, again, like the prong collar, you guys, like the prong collar isn't there to be that magic tool to fix everything. The prong collar is just to reinforce things. So when we're using remote collars, when we're using prong collars, it's there to just reinforce what we're saying. So they have to know what you're asking. So yes, you can use it and say, you can put the prong on and tap the dog and, and, and say, leave it. But you, you want to teach to leave it before you do that um, out, outside of that source or outside of that environment. And then you can, then you can apply the prong collar in that, that fashion. 
Um, how do you start training your dog to walk off leash? Uh, good question, David. I think that the most important thing with training your dog off leash is having a system. If you guys know, um, I really, really like being uh, responsible and using a tool that uh, communicates with them off leash. But I think um, the step from leash to off leash is a long line. Get yourself a 15 foot to 30 foot long line and um, start the process of recall and uh, teaching the dog to check in with you. Um, and uh, that's, the, that's the start, uh, I would say. Um, bup, 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 let's see, these questions are rolling in. Thank you guys. Hey, if you guys are here, uh, go ahead and like this video. Uh, I would appreciate that. Um, have you ever used an extra leash, like a whip? to the other dog. Um, yeah, I guess uh, you could use, you could tell a dog to back off like that um, or a stick, like to just kind of like basically herd the dog away. How did you get into professional dog training? Andrew's full of questions today. Um, I'll give you a crash course on how I got into dog training if you guys want. Um, and I have this on my podcast. Uh, if you guys haven't listened to my podcast, it's the No Bad Dogs podcast. But I started getting into dog training very organically. I started a dog walking company, uh, geez, almost 11, probably 11 years ago now. Um, it's something that I went to school for law enforcement uh, for a little bit, didn't really like that. And then I just went with something I really love, which was animals, uh, dogs specifically. And I started a dog walking business and I got one phone call from a client that said, hey, you're the dog guy. Uh, I walked downtown with, you know, you guys, if you guys get the, the, the message. I mean, you, you see those dog walkers with all those dogs. And I mean, that was me. I, I devoted my entire um, life in my 20s um, to dogs and professionally. Um, but I've always had a, had a really good connection with dogs. We have pictures of me handling dogs and I was three to four years old. Um, so I've always had a good connection with dogs, but long story short, somebody asked me to help them with their dog, uh, and I did. And at that point, uh, they had worked with three other professional trainers in the area, and all of those professional trainers uh, accumulated over 100 years of experience, and I was able to break through um, the best. Uh, and, and that, to me, was like, what? I did something differently than they did? They said, oh, this is unreal. Um, and so at, at that point I said, okay, maybe I have something here. And then I, I offered dog training for free for many, many, many weeks, uh, until I started having a waiting list and long story short, I got my own facility, uh, in an abandoned garage basically. Um, and, and I worked really hard and, um, everyone laughed at me and said I was dumb and stupid for wanting to train dogs for a living because it wasn't a real career. Um, and fast forward to now, um, I'm where I'm at now. Uh, we have eight to 10 employees at any given time with four full-time trainers at daycare and uh, we're growing and we're building and building and building. So it's pretty much how I got into it in a, <laughs> in a short uh, crash course here. We'll take some more questions. If you guys are here, don't forget to like this video. Woo if you guys like this video right now, I will get Lakota out and let her be cute if you guys want. Hmm. Uh, all right, so let's see. This is a good question, uh, little Deb Cakes. <laughs> uh, what do you suggest when you bring home a new dog? Currently, we have a 16-month-old Rottweiler male intact for now, bringing home to a new dog that's, that's also fixed. So this is a question I also get a lot. So this is a great question. If, if you, so the question is, guys, basically, is uh, we're bringing home a new dog. How do you integrate them properly? The first thing that you do not want to do is you do not want to throw them in your house right off the bat. That's like the, the worst thing that you can do unless you have puppy one, puppy two, no big deal. But if you get any dog pretty much over six, month, that six months of age and they're mature, um, that's something that you're going to run into a problem with. So crash course on that really quick. Ready? Uh, what we're going to do is uh, get the dogs out to a neutral location. So text, call, say, hey, uh, significant other, friend, neighbor, mom, dad, brother, sister, let's meet at the park. Let's go for a walk together. You go for a walk. You trail one dog behind the other like this, vice versa, let them sniff each other. And at that point, you'll be able to tell how they feel about each other. Now, if you're still a little bit nervous about having them completely interact, the best thing to do is find a fence. If you can't find a fence, you can't think of a fence, think of a tennis court. Every tennis court uh, that I know of has a, a chain link fence. 
So um, getting them uh, meeting through a chain link fence without a lot of pressure. A lot of people put a lot of pressure on the leash to make that situation very uncomfortable uh, and very um, uh, vulnerable for the dog. So making sure you're nice and relaxed, calm, take a deep breath, let them meet through the fence and, and read their body language. If it's good, then you can proceed to maybe walk towards and then you go to your neighborhood. Still not your yard, still not your house. Go to the neighborhood, do some laps with each other to make sure that there's no territorial issues because dogs will claim neighborhoods. Um, that's why they mark. Uh, so that's what you would do. And then you'd go to the yard and then you see how they do. And then you go to the backyard and see how they do. Um, and if you live in an apartment or an area where you don't have yards, then driveways, parking lots, uh, elevators, whatever. Um, and then once you feel good about that, the last step would be, uh, dog proofing your entire house. No bones, no toys, no food dishes, no bold, nothing, nothing that your dog can value. Um, I would probably leave the leashes on uh, as they as you do a meet and greet um, and kind of go from there. Um, one thing, if you're still a little nervous, there's always muzzles. There's always baby gates that you can separate the two with, but um, that's a process. So I think, I think that's like how you would do it, but the most important thing, how to not do it, throw them in the house and see what works. It's, it's really not a good idea. Dogs are extremely protective of their surroundings. And if you throw a random dog unbeknownst to them that you've been wanting this dog for six months or whatever, it's not a good idea. Uh, not a good idea. The other last thing on that is, is if you can get an item, if you're adopting that dog, fostering that, or um, getting it from a foster, if you can get some of their, um, their maybe having them sleep on a pillowcase for a couple of weeks and then bringing it into your house, that's another way you can start integrating that dog into your house. So I hope that helped. Um, yeah, and then the other thing, good call, Cheryl, is uh, hire a trainer. They can help you. Um, let's see. Amber asks, what if your dog is the one pulling and putting pressure on the leash? Mine gets too excited with other dogs. Prong collar works wonders from afar, but will still pull up close. Well, um, I think that's a good question. So basically the mechanics of the prong, you have to use leverage in order for it to work properly. So if you get a dog like right here and then they go whoop, boom, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be exact. Um, so I would be working on impulse control, but I also think that you have to be, you have to be a little bit, um, I think courteous and responsible and empathetic to the fact of if another dog is coming to you off leash, um, it's really hard for you to just tell your dog like, hey, sit there and do nothing. I mean, if the other dog is controlled and you guys can both work on sit stays and say, okay, like let's have the dogs meet, um, that's fine. But I think that there's like that switch of once they get close enough, I think it's a responsibility and a respect thing to say like, I can't expect you to just sit here and do absolutely nothing as this other dog approaches. Um, so I think impulse control is like the best thing that you could be doing. Um, yeah, so that that's what I would be working on is is being realistic. Like if another dog is that close um, and they're charging your dog, you can't really expect your dog to ignore that. They're gonna go and be a dog. So I think just creating boundaries with other dog owners as you're out for a walk and um, doing it that way. So let's see. Sarah asks, my three-year-old German Shepherd mix rescue uh, lives in isolation, very fearful, starting to show signs of aggression. What do we do about growling teeth bearing? Um, taking things away from her and controlling her. Uh, good question, Sarah. Uh, lived in isolation, so I don't think that they live in isolation now. Um, so it's a very fearful dog and aggressive because of the isolation, probably from the lack of exposure. Uh, you're welcome, Amber. Uh, enjoy. Cheers. Um, all right, you guys, we have, if we get 120 likes on this, I'll get Lakota out and she'll be cute. <laughs> Uh, so go ahead and like this video if you guys are here. Um, but let's talk about a dog that was in isolation um, and how to how to work with that and how to make things better with the isolation. Um, I think it's important for for you to understand that um, dogs who are in isolation, uh, just like with people, lack of exposure, lack of uh, stimulation, lack of hey, what is life? 120. I'll get her out right after I answer this question. Thank you guys. Um, lack of exposure. Lack of all of that stuff will, will, will make a dog be you know, really overexposed. I also think that it has a lot to do with um, the dog's breed and the dog's temperament. I've worked with dogs who have been abused and neglected, um, and they do not care. I mean, they just pop in your lap, and they act like nothing happened. So I think it has to do with the breed and the dog and the age. Um, but I would say that uh, slowly and surely, I, a lot of structure. I'm babbling. A lot of structure. Um, a lot of creating, 
um, a lot of walking, a lot of, a lot of training, find something that your dog likes. If it's food, if it's a ball, if it's a squeaker toy, whatever, get them out, put them on a leash and say, let's go train. I wouldn't let them possess things because it's going to be create that resource guarding. If your dog has been isolated for their whole life and you give them toys and stuff, they're going to resource guard that likely because they've never had those high value things. So lots of structure, lots of creating, lots of training. Um, to get your dog uh, to a great relationship with you so they trust you. Um, trust starts a lot of times with structure. Hey, you're in charge. You got it. Dogs don't like being in charge. So if you get a dog that has been isolated by themselves their whole life, they don't know the good from the bad. So I would make sure that you're doing a lot of that structure to crate, put them on the leash, go out for a walk, do some healing, do some sitting, do some placing, lots of positive reinforcement. Um, and that's how I would approach that situation because your dog is fearful for a reason. Your dog is, um, you know, it, it, it's a, it's, it, it can, it can be a very traumatic experience for dogs who have been isolated for a long period of time. Um, but that's, people are scumbags and people don't, you know, they don't take care of animals. They're bad people. Um, but if you do take that dog in and you make a decision to do right, take your time. Uh, some dogs need weeks, uh, maybe months to get them, um, better. And so just, just, I would say, depending on how long you've had the dog, be patient, um, and do the best you can to apply structure. The last thing you want to do, because I think that the most important thing is, is I tell you what not to do with a dog like that. Don't let them do what they want. Don't do not, not give them structure. Don't cause, cause some of the worst cases I've ever seen in my entire life with behavioral cases have been people getting dogs and feeling sympathetic for them and showing that through emotion. I'm going to get you. I'm going to let you do whatever you want because you've been abused. I'm going to give you all these treats, all these toys without working at all. Um, you can jump, you can pull on the leash, you can bark. I don't care because you've been through a lot of crap. That's like the best way to ruin a dog completely. Um, the first thing you should do is gain all of that back. Say you have nobody in the driver's seat and I'm going to help you with that. I'm in charge. It's not a militant thing. Uh, it's it's not even um, it's not a punishment thing by any means. It's just you need to help the dog create a better life through structure, um, and and that's what the military does for a lot of people as well. Is they're they're lost. They don't know up from down. They don't know anything, and they uh, do that. So let me get my dog out. Taylor, can you open that? I'm gonna have Taylor let Lakota out. You guys can ask some questions as Lakota gets out. She's gonna go crazy. And come here, Cokes. She's gonna go eat the other dog's food first. Taylor, grab her for it. Come here, Cokes. Come say hi. Come here. Come on. Always my girl. You guys asked for it. Here she is. So Lakota is my uh, duchy that you guys primarily uh, see in my dog training videos that I do or my Instagram. Um, so she's uh, four years old, and um, she's, she's a good girl. She knows three different languages. She knows French, German. Actually, French, German, English, yeah. Um, she, doesn't, she doesn't know them. She responds to their, their commands. So, yeah, she's very beautiful. So a lot of people think she's a Malinois. And to be honest, a lot of people uh, are right because the Malinois and the Dutch Shepherds, especially stateside, if they're not being bred in Holland or, or overseas in Europe, um, have different lines in them that are all pretty much mixed. Um, so, like, her, 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 her breed is Dutch Shepherd, but... Her litter has Malinois in them um, because of the color. So it's it's really just a coloration thing. So um, she's gonna see a girl. Um, anyway, so that's Lakota. Thompson's over here. You guys can see him. Um, Thompson, come here, pups. You guys can see Thompson. It's a two for one, people. Two for one. Come here, ham. Oh, so this is my big boy. Oh, yes. So Thompson uh, is actually a St. Bernard, obviously, but he's about, he'll be 11 this year. So he is an 11-year-old St. Bernard that um, went for probably a two-and-a-half-mile walk with us yesterday. Um, he's on a raw diet, and uh, he's trained, but he's not like Lakota, so he doesn't have a lot of obedience. He, he, he knows his obedience, but uh, he's not as fast like, like uh, Lakota is. But this is pretty much his life here. Yeah. Anyway, so let's get back to some questions. So I appreciate you guys hanging out with me today. Um, let's see. Yeah, they loved them, Taylor. Uh, okay, so do you offer any type of shadowing program? 
Um, I do. Um, so right now, obviously, I was, I've canceled many, many trips. I was supposed to be all over the country um, doing training. But uh, so obviously after this whole coronavirus pandemic thing slows down, um, yes, we do a, um, we do a, a shadow program where you come and you can stay with us. Um, and uh, actually you can, you can shadow me and my other trainers, um, as many, as much as you want, they're in programs. And, uh, but right now, obviously we're kind of in lockdown and we're also developing, um, some new stuff, uh, to, to have people come and hang out with us for a while. So let's see, um, where do you get your raw food from? Um, yeah, I get it locally from a place called Roganics. It's a local farm. Um, that's actually around here. I would suggest people, uh, let's say hi to Taylor. Taylor, she's doing a puzzle. Um, but I would say just finding a local farmer or a butcher or somebody that you guys can get your locally sourced uh, um, protein from and then mixing in your other stuff. So let's see. So this is a good question. Um, I don't know how to say this name correctly, so I'm sorry, but Indre maybe um, basically asked, my concern is, uh, no, sorry, what kind of tools uh, should I be using for everyday walks for a dog that's reactive? Um, when you are not training a session, do you give a dog a break? I'm going to answer it just like that. Um, so that's a great question. The tools that you're going to be using all kind of represent your environment and your ability, uh, as a dog handler. So I tell people that, um, like I have a remote collar on Lakota because of the environment. So if I'm out, um, and she's, she'll recall to me almost every time, but if there is, I have to be realistic, you know, so I have to think about uh, squirrels. Like yesterday, there was ducks. There were deer tracks everywhere. There were other dogs off leash. So for her, like your, your equipment is going to be based off of your environment. So if you're going to walk in an area that has a lot of dogs um, or a lot of people, um, which chances are if you're in this coronavirus pandemic thing like everyone is, you're going to see a lot of dogs more than usual on your walk. And you're going to have to um, plan appropriately. So I think the real question is, is uh, how do you give your dog a break? Well, for me, it's all about the break command. So with look, like any of my dogs that I train, the first thing I teach them besides heel is break. So teach, stop. this is what she does. She gives so many kisses, which is why she's in the crate um, if she's not working. But um, yeah, I know. So what I would do is teach your dog a break. So what, I, what we do in our program is work and play. It's on, it's off. That's it. it there's no real um, in-between gray area. So if your dog is healing, they're healing until you say break. Uh, if your dog is staying, they're staying until you say break or anything like that. So I have videos on the break command on my channel I would recommend to look at. But yes, absolutely. When you're out with your dog, um, if you're going to tell them that they have to work, I think it's absolutely fair and crucial for you to also be able to tell them to turn it off um, because it's they get confused. There's that gray area of, hey, you want me to heal, but now I don't have to heal. What's that? You say break and then they do what they want. So the break command is one of my top, top, top top commands uh, to teach a dog. So um, that's, that's, that's big. Break command. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. Christy asks, I got a new puppy and whenever I try to tell her to do something like sit or come, my other dog will come and where's the confusion? Very simple. When you're training a new dog, new behaviors, you want to be isolated from any other animals in your house. Um, so I get the question a lot about, like I was telling you guys earlier about Lakota being trilingual. Um, I, that's, the, that's why I do uh, different languages with my dogs is because when I'm training them, I don't want them to get confused. Um, so the most uh, beneficial answer I can give you is if you're training a new dog, new behaviors, especially if you're using food, that other dog is going to be boop right here, uh, ready to do the work as well. Uh, and it's not going to be beneficial because then they're going to... Um, they're going to get distracted. So just train separately from the other dog until uh, you feel like they know the difference between each other. And the also thing is, is uh, voice inflection on uh, their names. So, hey, new dog, do this. No, not you, other dog. Um, so Samantha asks, I've got a four-month-old Doberman. Heals nicely, however, doesn't focus on me. How can I encourage him to continue to look at me while I heal? Well, that's a good question. Um, so there's something called a, a competitive heel or a focused heel. And um, that's, that's something that people work on. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, difficult thing for people to accomplish 
um, if you're trying to just randomly do it. So a focused heel is something that, if you watch my recent video of uh, if, is playing tug with your dog a bad thing or can make them aggressive, you'll see Lakota uh, doing focused healing, uh, and I've taught her that. So what I, what I tell people is teach your dog how to touch on a touchpad, um, and I have a, a segment of videos on, on how to do the focused heel you can look up in my YouTube channel. Um, but teach the dog touch and then teach them to focus on you and then you put it into, into, into going forward. Um, and it's something you do incrementally. So you go from A to B, B to C, and then you go A to C and so on and so forth. So it's something that takes a lot of practice. Um, and just teaching your dog the focus command and teaching your dog the heel command and combining them in increments will uh, allow you to do that. But it is something that you have to practice. Okay, let's see. How do I set up a shadow program? It's not, it's not on the website. It's not. Um, you just email. Um, you can email us. You can find our email on our website, and Taylor will take care of it. Um, so this is a good. This is a good question, um, Christina. I am actually putting on another podcast. I'm doing at least two a week right now during quarantine because I'm doing a lot of online sessions. Um, can you retrain a dog on an e-collar as positive reinforcement or positively uh, after a bad experience? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so you definitely, definitely, definitely can. Um, all you have to do is put the collar on the dog for about a week. Don't don't even turn it on. Just put it on the put it on the dog. Um, and do your basic training with a lots of positive reinforcement. Now, if your dog is shying away from the collar, just take your time. Once it's on, positive reinforcement, tug toy, whatever they're motivated by. Tug toys, food, whatever. And then you just go down to their levels. So that's why I closely work with Dogtra. Um, they're my favorite remote collar uh, training company, and they make really great collars that are very user-friendly. There's many other uh, collars that are out there, but Dogtra really focuses on being extremely uh, user-friendly and digestible, which matches exactly my education and my training philosophies as well. I want to help as many people as I possibly can without diving too deep into a lot of dog training terminology that's going to make people go crazy. So uh, the dog tree units are really great because they have low levels. So you start off on a very low level. Um, if it was trained wrong, they probably used um, high, high levels on a dog and it didn't make sense to them and potentially is, uh, is, is not beneficial. So retrain through positive reinforcement and motivation on really low levels. That's the best advice I can give for that. This is fun. If you guys are uh, here, go ahead and uh, like this video. Let me know you're here. Um, let's see. All right. 15 month old lab, great in everywhere, excited for new people, new dogs, etc. How can I work on this during quarantine? 15 month old lab. I would be working on labs are great. They're one of my favorite breeds to train. Um, I would be working on, um, I would be working on the place command. I would be working on impulse control. So teaching it like, again, you have to ask yourself if you haven't done any pre existing behaviors to manage the situation, to manage the dog, uh, heal, uh, sit, stay place, etc. So if somebody comes up and you haven't taught your dog how to sit, and stay and they're sitting there like excited to see that person but they're not moving boom that's it that's the first thing you got to do you can't there's no way you're going to be able to stop a lab uh from getting really excited about people um but you can certainly control it like same thing i'll show you with lakota like she wants to play tug with this little emoji uh toy here and so if i just ask her to to coda house coda out so the problem is she's on this thing, but so like with her, like impulse control, like she wants this really bad, right? It's her favorite thing in the world is a tug. She's drooling. Yes. Good. Out. So she out. Good. So the problem is, is she's on this bench. So every time I hold it, she's pulling. So it's hard for her to out, but yes. So anyway, yes. Good. Bye. So anyway, so impulse control, uh, teaching your dog what they can and can't do is crucial. I mean, having something that they really want to do but being able to control that on and off switch, huge. All right, we'll take a couple more. Um, let's see. Carly, that's a good one. I could probably do that at some point. Um, and I do have a code for Dogtra. If you guys are interested in Dogtra, 
Um, I do have a code for them. You can use no bad dog. So NBD10 and you get 10% off uh, during checkout. Excuse me. Koda, go. Well, that was a lot of questions. Wow, there's a lot of questions coming in. I'm trying to... How long have I been training dogs? Um, I've been working professionally for about uh, 11, almost 11 years. Uh, but training, I've been training for... Six or seven, I think. Um, how do you, uh, geez, this. Melissa asks, how do you stop, a, how do you stop a dog from window barking? Um, okay, so if your dog is barking at the window, a couple things is like, if there's somebody coming by and they're walking, right? Your dog's natural instincts is gonna say, hey, I'm alerting everyone here on the property that there's somebody out there. Um, so that's something that like, so don't be so about how can I get my dog from stop barking in general, but more about how can I get my dog to stop barking once they start? Uh, because I think it's unrealistic to say, how do I get my dog to stop barking at the window? It's a little hard when there are squirrels and people walking by and other dogs and whatever. Um, so mental stimulation. So exercise is really important. So getting your dog out and giving them something to do is, is a great idea. Um, to make sure that they're exhausted mentally, um, because if they're sit, if they're basically, I see this all the time. Like, and I'm walking, especially during quarantine, um, a lot of dogs are sitting inside and they're bah, 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 doing this because they don't get to go out, so they're they're like they're 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 bored. Um, so I would say that's that's one thing. Second thing is is just teach them to leave it. So like with Lakota, you guys have seen many times in this video, if she barks because she thinks she hears something, I don't get mad at that. I say, hey, okay, leave it. And I, and I disengage her that way. If it's at the window specifically, you can work on your place command. You can work on all that stuff um, in order to, to disengage that. But you have to, you have to correct it uh, and you have to reinforce it. So putting a leash on your dog during that time um, and so on and so forth to, to take care of the situation. You guys know I'm really big about if you're having a problem with your dog but you haven't addressed it properly, it's never going to get better. So... Um, so I, uh, I'm actually getting, um, some new equipment to go live, which is why I didn't go live earlier at the, at the, at the time. Um, because I'm, I'm setting up a new live equipment, uh, system where I'm going to go live from my Sony instead of my iPhone. So it's going to be a lot clearer. Um, there, I'm not going to have to worry about lighting as much and stuff. Um, so I'm going to be doing that. I'm excited about that. Um, and let's see. So I have a, a, a seminar in May that I'm, I think is going to happen. Um, as of right now, New York State is is supposed to be mandated to shut down all non-essential businesses until um, April 26th or something like that, um, which then opens us up to hopefully go back to semi-normal uh, travel and stuff like that. So uh, I do have a, an event in May in Ohio. It's really hard right now. I'm not pushing it for people to sign up because I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but, uh, keep in, keep in, keep in touch for that because it's one of the only events I'm going to do this year for sure because of this whole thing. Um, and I, and I, and I, it's, it's in the middle of May, which gives us enough time. I think we'll be okay with that. Um, you guys can visit that on my website at, uh, America's Canine Educator slash calendar. You guys can sign up there and get more details on that. Um, and then as well, so earlier I posted in the community thing on YouTube, like what questions you guys want to be answered. Um, so when I do that, that's the questions I'm going to uh, answer. So if you guys want me to answer questions, you just go to the community board when I post and I say, Hey, I'm going to go live today or tomorrow. That's where you guys can leave uh, your questions about uh, the next live video. Um, so anyway, so I'm going to try to do this again, maybe tomorrow, if you guys want to hang out and do that. Uh, if you guys haven't yet, don't forget, like this video before you exit this screen. Um, you guys can follow me on Instagram at Tom Davis. You can follow my business at Upstate Canine Academy. And, and of course, if you guys haven't yet, um, subscribe to my channel if you want more of these videos. Um, and we're going to be doing a dog tree giveaway, actually. I don't know if it's next live or the one after that, but we're going to be giving away a dog tree remote collar, um, which is really awesome because dog trees, uh, 
that's a, that's a cool thing for them to do. So we're going to be doing that. Um, and if you guys uh, want, you guys can uh, watch this video after it's live. It's no big deal. And like a video, comment below. Let me know what you want to see in the next video as well. I always look through those comments to see what you guys want. Um, but thank you guys so much. Uh, I hope you guys are safe and um, well. And Lakota and I are yes, uh, going to enjoy the rest of the day. So thank you guys so much for, for joining me. I'll talk to you next time. Bye.